Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to its rainmaking time because the time is urgent. We need advanced technologies and advanced abilities for being able to help us navigate these times. You are going to meet somebody who has been predicting earthquakes for many, many years. It is true that earthquakes can be predicted. Don't believe people that tell you that they can't. Jim Berklin is here who has been a geologist for many, many years. He's a 50-year fellow with the Geological Society. He has breakthrough information for you. Please listen and welcome Jim Berklin to It's Rainmaking Time. Good morning. Uh, thank you for, for that great introduction. And this is a critical time, such as I have not felt since uh, October of uh, 1989 when I predicted the World Series quake in the newspaper, named it. Uh, we are having similar period from the sun and moon lining up uh, at the time of the full moon. This is called the worm moon, the full moon of uh, March. And it's less than one hour away from the time of the closest approach of the moon that we will see until the year 2016, when in November of that year, the moon will be even a little bit closer. So, and then the next day, we have the, the equinox, is the opening day of spring. So three major tide-raising factors lining up sun, moon, and earth. That's called syzygy, new or full moon. Nearness of the moon, which is perigee. And then there's an equinoctial tide at the time of the equinoxes. So you put them all together in the same 24-hour period, and we expect extremely high tides. Now, they're not necessarily always expressed by ocean tide maximum periods. But earth tide, the solid earth moves up and down about three feet under the full moon. And that affects groundwater and fluids in the in the earth, such as magma and oil. And these times, for example, the only thing holding a fault together is friction. And it takes a certain amount of time between slippages of fault, uh, depending upon how active the fault is to begin with. It may be you know a couple hundred years between major failures, or maybe just like around uh, the geysers in Yellowstone, where the quakes are happening all the time because of movement of steam and fluids in the subsurface. But it turns out that so many of the larger quakes occur at predictable times. Now, in Southern California, I was born in 1930. My folks moved us back to Iowa for, to see the folks uh, in 1933, just before the Long Beach earthquake, which was devastating down there. And and the records now indicate there could have been 30,000 school kids killed had the quake occurred not at quarter to six at night, but about two in the afternoon when all those old buildings, weak buildings, collapsed on them. Well, that was on the day of an eclipse of the moon. And the next big quake in Southern California was in, Los, in, Long, in uh, San Fernando, you know, February 9th of 1971. That was on the day of the eclipse of the moon. Now, was that San Fernando or San Francisco? San Fernando, okay. 1971. And uh, so that was also on the day of the eclipse of the moon. Uh, the biggest quake in North America that we know about was the 9.2 Alaskan quake in March 27, 1964, on the day of the full moon. And then the next big uh, tsunami and uh, the 9-point magnitude quake uh, the next one after 64 was 2004 in the Indian Ocean. And that was on the day after Christmas. And guess what? Day of the full moon. The biggest quake in the Yellowstone area was on the day of the full moon. The biggest quake in the Tehachapi area uh, the, the last century was uh, the, uh, the Kern County quake, 7.7 .7 on the day of the new moon. And one would see a pattern if you keep looking at these things. And my colleagues are getting all their truth out of black boxes and believing implicitly on them what, because their professor told them the same thing. Earthquakes cannot be predicted. They are random events. Well, I had to unlearn that when I found out what's really going on. And not only that, the animals are aware before large quakes especially. And I'm getting more and more concerned about what I hear around Los Angeles area. Uh, at, uh, at Malibu in December, this very rare fish, eel-like fish about 12 feet long, washed up on the beach alive. And the people were, what is, what is this? Well, they normally live down, they're called an oar fish. They live down about a mile deep under the ocean. This was on the beach. 
And a little boy, an eight-year-old boy, came up and identified it. That's an oarfish. My teacher says you know, she saw pictures of it. Well, anyway, an oarfish, if you go to Google and look it up, you see the Japanese called it an earthquake fish. And there were oarfish uh, beached in near, near uh, Japan last year. And it was highlighted in the, in the headlines. Does this mean a big earthquake for Japan? Um, you have a massive schools of fish coming into shore and beaching themselves like whales and dolphins as they did before the World Series quake and did just before the great Indian Ocean quake. Well, we had this massive fish kill at Redondo Beach here about two weeks ago. All these fish filled up the, boat, the boats. They could, the boat, it was so thick with fish they could hardly move the boats. And they all died, and I guess they were turned up in uh, recycling or somewhere. But the fish died, and we were told, well, they were probably frightened and scared in by a scavenger or by a, well, sharks or something, baloney. Um, and then we just heard about uh, massive uh, fish came in by uh, Acapulco. And they were out scooping them up and uh, harvesting them. Very unusual situation. And then we heard about a very unusual thing off San Diego. The whale watchers here this last week are surprised to see a couple of dozen sperm whales, very rare sperm whales, all around the boat. And they'd never seen such a pod of whales in history. Uh, and uh, so it goes on and on and on. And so if you see a strange animal behavior, uh, lost dogs and cats. Before the World Series quake, uh, I'd been monitoring this lost and found animals in the local paper, the Mercury News, for uh, since 19... 19- 79, when a physicist with Xerox acquainted me with the fact that the lost and found column lengthened just before local quakes. So I, almost, I almost hung up on him because at that time I was dealing mainly with tides. And it suddenly hit, as I was talking to him, I suddenly realized that our cat Rocky had disappeared six days before a 5.9 quake at Gilroy, the strongest quake in the Bay Area uh, since uh, uh, 1911. And uh, so uh, I, then I listened to it much more carefully to this, geo, this, uh, this physicist from um, physicist from Xerox uh, because he said the missing cat ads went up, and sure enough, before that seven for that uh, 5.9 quake at Gilroy, um, they had 12 missing cat ads instead of the usual three or four, and that's when I realized our cat Rocky had disappeared six days before that same quake. Jim, can you explain a couple of parts of this just to bring us into your level of knowledge? Is this from the magnetic field changes? You got it. You got it. And the, this physicist thought it was the change in gravity, but there was no real mechanism. How did they detect this? Now we know that animals, including bacteria, homing pigeons, whales, sharks, salmon, uh, European robins, and I used to raise homing pigeons. They all have the mineral magnetite in their bodies that they grow as a significant part. Um, they use it for navigation. And when I raised homing pigeons, and I, I'm sitting in the same property that I was raised in, uh, in, in the uh, early, in the 40s, I had pit homing pigeons here, and I took a couple in a knapsack and to the top of the mountain about three miles away, and I told my sister, uh, I'm going to let them go at 2 o'clock, see what time they get back. Well, they took their time... <laughs> Because instead of flying straight home, like I could see our house off in the distance, they circled and circled and circled. As they do when they release a, a bunch of pigeons at a sporting event or something, they, they circle and circle four or five or times and maybe more, and then they split off into different directions as they head for their home loft. But it was always a mystery until about 30 years ago when they found the mineral magnetite behind the pigeons' eyeballs. And why would they circle? Because we have a magnetic field circling the Earth, and that's where the aurora borealis uh, lines come down from the pole, the magnetic poles. And uh, so if you have a magnetic material in your body, like the pigeons do, and you circle around in a magnetic field, you generate, uh, you, it's a microgenerator. It actually creates electrical fields. And their little brain then tells them which direction is north, and then through their past knowledge, they know which direction to fly to their home loft. And before earthquakes, many pigeons cannot find their way home. They'll sit down in a park or a schoolyard or something and wait for things to settle down. And I've 